you have to talk about the trade-offs because if you look at, um, in California, we're talking about adding, I think it's 500,000 acres for just more decarbonizing of the utility industry. And in California, there's 1.2 million acres used for off-road vehicles. So let's look at what the comparisons are and start to look at those. And it's, it's just, when it gets back to my story, it's, uh, you know, I chair the Ocean Protection Council. We had scientists do what sea level rise would be in 2050 and 2100, and they had to do a median because if we're successful with emissions, it'll rise a little less. If we're not successful with emissions, it'll rise a little more, and it's 14 inches in 2050, 55 inches in 2100. So you have to start thinking about those trade-offs because I am sure there's somebody in this audience or the radio audience uh, that lives somewhere uh, between sea level and 55 inches that's scratching their head right now <clears throat> and checking their actuarial table on their life expectancy. <laughs> <laughs> and when you get people to start to think that way, you understand this is serious. There's some trade-offs we have to make. How do we motivate people to do what we have to do? David Festa, transmission lines through some beautiful area state parks, willing to make some trade-offs? Well, I'd actually, like, <laughs> I'd actually like to push back a little bit on uh, Secretary Laird on, on the issue of sort of uh, trade-offs. And I really think it all has to do with timelines. So if you're focused on a project-by-project -project basis, you're going to inevitably be in this tough tug-of-war between competing priorities on a project-by-project -project basis. But if we get past that project-by-project -project and start to say, look, here's the areas where we know there's awesome opportunities for mitigation, to, to restore species, to restore habitat. And that can more than offset any development that, that we have because we also have this other part, the other side of the coin, where we have avoided uh, the worst impacts and minimized the impacts on site. Then, things, then, then the overall, the result is net improvement. And, and so that makes the discussion just a really, really different discussion. And that's where I think we have to keep our, we have to keep our eye on that horizon. I think what, what David's saying is, is, is some things that are perceived as trade-offs are really winning situations for everyone. I think he's right. And uh, the one thing is, is that we do have the timeline issue of trying to move over the short term and then the long term. And the thing that has surprised me since I've been secretary is that there is this general move. Try to move to mitigate regionally. Try to look at not an individual dam or an individual uh, uh, wetlands, but the entire watershed. Try to look not at one species by itself, but what's the entire wildlife corridor that allows this species to move and live and reproduce. And the thing about it is, is that is a transition as well. That is not the way we've been thinking. It's uh, not what, the way the laws are written, <clears throat> the Endangered Species no. Act, a lot of other things, right? Exactly. And it, it <clears throat> but when you have, a, uh, we were talking beforehand off stage about needing in certain places some pilots on certain issues to prove that concepts work to convince people that they need to think in this broader level. And so David's right. The challenge is, is how do you hold things or how do you get to those broader views while trying to do things right now? And that's the challenge.